the subject at hand is one that I do believe is extremely important, evangelism and the doctrine of hell. And one reason I believe this subject matter is so important is because the servants of Jesus Christ have been given the order to evangelize at all times and in all places. And the doctrine of hell is crucial to our evangelism. And I pray that this meeting tonight will serve as a motivation and as an incentive for all of us to carry out the task of evangelism. And I'm hopeful that this meeting will be used by the Lord to strengthen your resolve and clear up any uncertainties that may be circling around in the minds and hearts of young and old alike. So with that said, first of all, what is evangelism? J.I. Packer in his excellent book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, says this, Evangelism means presenting Christ Jesus to them, sinners, as their only hope in this world or the next. Evangelism means exhorting sinners to accept Christ Jesus as their Savior, recognizing that in the most final and far-reaching sense they are lost without him. Nor is this all. He goes on and says evangelism also means Summoning men to receive Christ Jesus as all that he is, Lord as well as Savior, and therefore to serve him as their king in the fellowship of his church, the company of those who worship him, uh, witness to him, and work for him here on earth. In other words, evangelism is the issuing of a call to turn as well as to trust. It is the delivering not merely of a divine invitation to receive a savior but of a divine command to repent of sin and there is no evangelism where this specific application is not made and if that uh, causes your head to spin a little bit don't worry too much about it because that was the busiest slide we're going to have this evening. Uh, Packer goes on to summarize evangelism by saying this The New Testament answer is very simple. Evangelism is simply preaching the gospel. I want to say that again. Evangelism is very simply preaching the gospel. It is a work of communication in which Christians make themselves mouthpieces for for God's message of mercy to sinners. Anyone who faithfully delivers the message under whatever circumstances, a large meeting, a small meeting, from a pulpit, or in a private conversation is evangelizing. So we have a message that we are to share in evangelism. That message is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the delivering of that message involves the summoning of hearers to conversion. If you're not calling hearers to conversion, if you're not calling souls to repent and believe the gospel, you are not evangelizing. But the way to tell whether you are evangelizing or not is not to ask how many souls are being saved as a result of your witness, but it's simply to ask whether or not you are being faithful in giving the message. You might share the gospel with thousands upon thousands of people for uh, decades on end and not learn of the first conversion. That does not mean that you are not evangelizing. And likewise, a non-evangelistic pastor might preach a sermon and someone be genuinely saved, be be truly converted. That doesn't mean that he is evangelizing. Packer also cited two motives that should spur each of us to evangelism. They are, first of all, love for God and a desire to see him glorified. Secondly, love of mankind and concern for their welfare. He said the first motive is primary. The chief end of man is to what? Glorify God, right? Men glorify God by obeying his word and fulfilling his revealed will. Before the ascension of Christ, he commanded his disciples to do the following. If you have your Bibles, I'm open to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, verse number 18 through 20. Here the word of God says this, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And then over in John chapter 14, verse number 21, the Lord Jesus Christ said these words. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So for a Christian to talk to the lost about the Lord Jesus Christ and his saving grace and his power to save, that in and of itself is a God-glorifying task. It's a God-glorifying thing to do. The second motive is love for our neighbor and a desire to see our fellow human beings saved by the grace of God. And this is just the natural outflow of the love of Christ in the hearts of everyone who is born again uh, because it is a great privilege to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and we should not be reluctant about doing so. I'm going to Mark chapter 12, verse number 30. Mark chapter 12 and verse number 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Now, let me take you back in time about 30 years to when I was a younger man, much younger, about 30 years younger. I was working on a traveling bridge crew overlaying bridge decks and building bridges up and down the East Coast and I spent the majority of my time in Virginia Beach and during this portion of my life which lasted only about three years I lived out of a suitcase moving from one motel room to the next and I had another young man whom I worked with who was just a few years older than me and he became my regular roommate, and we became very good friends. And uh, I preferred to room with him rather than the other men on the crew because he wasn't the, uh, the party hard, live hard type. And uh, he was drawn to me for the same reasons. And I remember as a 19-year-old young man after a hard day of jackhammering and sandblasting and pouring concrete, uh, we would retire to the motel room and get cleaned up and grab something for supper and then we'd try to find something to watch on television until it was time to fall asleep and get up and do it again the next day. And a lot of times we could agree on what to watch on TV, but sometimes I would just let him control the remote and I'd busy myself some other way. I wasn't a Christian back then, but it was around this time that I began to notice those little Gideon Bibles. Have you ever seen the Gideon Bibles in the motel rooms? It was about that time that I really began to catch, uh, those began to catch my attention. And sometimes when I would relinquish control of the television over to my roommate and needed something else to do, I'd pick up the Bible and begin to read. And I remember even then being drawn to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels. And I went through a stage as a 19-year-old young man where I was soaking up the teachings of the Lord. And although it would be about seven more years before I came to Christ in saving faith and repentance, I can still vividly recall being struck by the many, many places in the Gospels where Christ spoke about hell. So about seven years later, in 2001, God granted me saving faith. In repentance, and soon my passion for reading the scriptures revived. But this time things were different because now I had the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit where I did not have his presence before. So I picked up the Bible again, this time for the first time ever as a believer. And I began soaking it up all over again. And although it had been years since I had read the Bible seriously, I immediately 
noticed the same thing as a believer that I had noticed seven years earlier as an unbeliever, and that being the frequent and numerous times in Scripture where Jesus Christ spoke about hell. There was no theme that seemed to burden his preaching more than the doctrine of hell. So what is hell? Hell is spoken of in the scriptures as a place of eternal torment. And those who die without the Lord Jesus Christ will go there. Every unforgiven sin committed by every person who rejects Jesus Christ will be justly punished by a holy God forever in this dreadful place called hell. And there are many, many verses in the Bible about hell that we could look at tonight. I'll give you a few in just a moment, but we must understand this. The mention of hell is vital when addressing salvation. Christ didn't come to merely save us from depression or poverty or a bad marriage or a broken heart. He came to save us from a dreadful everlasting hell. Our Lord Jesus Christ consistently warned sinners of the awful reality of hell. So let's look in Luke chapter 16. In Luke 16, Jesus speaks a parable about a man who went to hell. Verse number 19 is where I'll begin reading now. Luke 16 and 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that as the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So we can see here from the words of Christ that hell signified here by the word Hades in this particular instance is a place where people go after they die. It's a place of thirst. It's a place of great torments and a place of a flame. Let's continue in verse 25. But Abraham said, said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So here Jesus is letting us know that once a person goes to hell, there's no way out. They'll be there forever. And the verdict will be administered by a perfectly just judge and uh, the verdict will either be guilty or not guilty by virtue of having the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. For those who are in Christ, there will be a reward. But for those who do not belong to Christ, there will be a punishment. And each and every person will either face the judgment of God on the basis of their works. Or they'll face the judgment of God on the basis of the work of Christ. Amen. And we need Christ. Amen. We need Jesus Christ. And the people that we endeavor to evangelize, uh, evangelize, they need Christ. We've all sinned and we've all come short of the glory of God. And without Christ, we'll have to stand before a holy God on our own merit. And I hope we all know that won't go well. So let me just head something off here. My intention is not to get into the debate as to whether or not, because we mentioned a flame... Uh, I'm not going to get into the debate tonight whether or not that is a literal flame. I have my views, and I've also learned that there's a lot of solid theologians out there that I greatly respect and have gleaned a lot from who do not agree with me on that, and I don't consider them to be unbelievers. 
especially when they insist that hell is going to be worse than you think it is. So if you're a young person here today and you want to press in on this and you go to a church where your pastor is a solid pastor and he preaches the word of God, go to him and, and talk to him about that and he'll be able to give you some scriptural guidance. There's just a lot of things that we just cannot have the time to get into tonight and it's not part of the objective for this service. But with that said, I do believe that we can all agree with Mr. Sproul on this. He said, if I'm going to take Jesus seriously, and if I'm going to take the apostolic testimony seriously, then I need to take hell seriously. Amen. Amen. So if you've sought to share your faith much at all, you have probably experienced a particular kind of pressure. And it's a pressure that comes from the unsaved world, and sadly it all too often comes from those who profess to be saved children of God and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about the pressure to tone down, minimize, water down, or completely omit any mention of hell or any mention of God's future judgment in our communication with the lost. In my 20 plus years of evangelism, I've noticed that the number of people who believe that hell is a subject matter to be avoided or watered down or toned down or suppressed, that number has sadly grown and continues to grow, even among people who would consider themselves to be theologically conservative. That may be the most disturbing part. What really amazes me is that there are still many who say that they believe in hell. They say that they still believe in a future judgment of God, but if you ask them whether or not the topic of hell should be raised in our evangelistic efforts, they'll say, no, you shouldn't bring it up. You shouldn't mention hell at all. All you're doing is scaring people. All you're doing is pushing people away if you mention hell. And they will tell you that speaking about hell is not only ineffective in evangelism, but they'll tell you that it's harmful and even unloving for you to mention hell. But to state that speaking about hell is ineffective and harmful and unloving is a relative truth claim that is based on something other than God's revealed will and such a notion is not supported in Scripture. So preachers who preach about the reality of hell, they are often condescendingly labeled as Bible thumpers, that old fire and brimstone preacher. They're labeled as such by people who would try to paint them in a negative light, and it's not only coming from the lost, unregenerate world, but it's coming from those who profess to be Christians as well. The idea that preaching the truth of hell is harmful and ineffective that's nothing new, even though we have thousands of historical witnesses for hundreds of years going back in the form of sermons and books and tracts and other writings uh, from uh, hundreds of years ago that testify to us very clearly that hell was common subject matter among gospel preachers and it was commonplace for preachers to preach about hell in the church house or the meeting place among Christians, but it was also commonplace uh, to preach about hell to the lost in public. Uh, talking about in the public square. Yet Ron Denton in his book, Even If None, he cites a quote from Tertullian from around 200 AD that verifies that some of the earliest Christians endured this same type of ridicule. Tertullian wrote this, and I quote, We get ourselves laughed at for for proclaiming that God will one day judge the world, though, like us, poets and philosophers set up a judgment seat in the world below. And if we threaten Gehenna, a reservoir of secret fire under the earth for purposes of punishment, we have derision heaped upon us. End quote. So, even then, there were those who spoke about hell, and they were being ridiculed for it. So in our day and time, in 2023, there is a current of professing Christians who take the position that preaching 
about hell or, or mentioning hell in conversations with other people, they'll tell you that that is unsophisticated, they'll tell you that that is ineffective, and that it should not be done in a civilized society. So the pressure mounts. The pressure builds up to avoid any mention of this dreadful place called hell. But when we examine what has been recorded for us in the scripture, we don't see any sign or semblance of Christians telling other people, telling other Christians that they shouldn't preach about hell. We don't see that example in the Bible where Christians told other Christians to keep quiet about hell or any other truth that might be uncomfortable for that matter. When we read the writings of the early church, we don't see Christians telling other Christians to avoid hell or judgment in order to accommodate society, yet that is what we're being told by many today. But biblical evangelism includes warning others about the reality of hell. And we cannot omit the mention of hell for the sake of trying to make the gospel more attractive. And for the sake of trying to make the gospel less offensive. You see, the gospel is already the power of God unto salvation. God does not need us to edit the gospel or to enact changes to the gospel or to try to approve, improve upon the gospel. There's absolutely nothing that we can do to improve upon the gospel, but yet many seem to believe that the gospel somehow needs their recommendations and uh, improvements in order for another soul to be saved, and it all comes at the expense of true biblical evangelism. So I've also noticed that sometimes Christians don't seem to have any problem about professing the reality of hell to other Christians, but when it comes time to talk to unbelievers about hell, that conviction goes out the window. I was preaching on campus at Appalachian State a couple of years ago when a professing Christian heard the preaching and approached me and said that it was a, a disgrace for me to be on a college campus warning lost souls about hell. And this person, who professed to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, told me that the college campus was neither the time nor the place for such an activity. And this was coming from a person who said that they believed in the doctrine of hell. Okay? If the college campus with potentially thousands of lost souls walking about in broad daylight is not the proper time nor the place to preach about hell. When is it Amen. the proper time and the place to preach about the reality of hell? Are we supposed to suppress the truth of hell and then wait until it's too late to sound the warning? Why are so many believers ashamed of the doctrine of hell? Well, Romans chapter 1 has something to say about this. Romans chapter 1 verses 18 and 19. Let me read it to you. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shewed it unto them. To hold the truth here is to suppress the truth. And the truth in this verse is a reference to the gospel, and we know this because just two verses prior Paul had stated, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, so in regard to holding the truth, it was Van Til who said, he used the analogy of taking that volleyball and holding that down underneath the water in a swimming pool. And if you push that volleyball down, you are suppressing that volleyball under the water. And if you remove your hand from that volleyball, what happens? It pops back up to the surface. 
so what I find interesting is that Romans chapter 1 and verse number 18 speaks of the wrath of God as being against those who suppress the truth. But many professing Christians would advise us to suppress the truth about the wrath of God. So they're guilty of the very thing that Romans chapter 1 speaks against and we should not allow them to influence our evangelistic efforts. May God grant us all the grace and the strength to follow the revealed will of God and not unbiblical opinions. In his book, Ashamed of the Gospel, two copies were given away tonight. John MacArthur points out that nowadays the wrath of God is almost entirely missing. From most attempts to present the gospel, it's not popular to speak of the wrath of God against sin or to inform people that they're going to stand in God's judgment. And he cites how Paul started with the wrath of God against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, but in modern evangelistic approaches, we start with God loves you and he wants you to be happy. He even likens evangelism that intentionally removes the mention of hell to heresy. He said, rather than arousing a fear of God, it attempts to portray him as fun, jovial, easygoing, lenient, and even permissive. Haughty sinners who ought to approach God in terror are emboldened to presume upon his grace. Sinners hear nothing of the divine wrath. This is as wrong as preaching rank Heresy. So, when we take the doctrine of hell and we cast that off or try to tone it down or try to water it down or try to omit that completely, it does not improve evangelism. It sabotages evangelism. And sadly, there's no shortage of this going on today. And there's a heavy demand for an ear-tickling type of preaching, and that demand brings about a large supply as people turn away their ears from the truth and turn unto fables. MacArthur goes on to cite a survey, and, and Ryan Denton uh, talks about this information too, and even if none, Brother Delbert, you've got that book. It's a good book. Amen. It's an excellent book. But he cites a survey from the University of Chicago from 1987 and gives a very shocking statistic that being that 46% of evangelical seminary students surveyed believe that it's showing, quote unquote, poor taste. Poor taste to preach about hell to unbelievers. Now that was 36 years ago. Imagine how much higher that percentage might be today in 2023. And that's not all. This may be even more disturbing. A Barner report from 1992 reveals that three out of every ten self-professed born-again believers who were surveyed, this blows my mind, three out of ten professed born-again believers who were surveyed believe that people will still go to heaven when they die even if they have never come to Christ in faith and repentance. 30%. Did you catch that? 30% of professing Christian survey, surveyed said that good people will still go to heaven when they die, even without Jesus. Mind boggling. But this issue of seeking to avoid any mention of hell in our evangelism is not merely taking place in churches that have a faulty view of hell. We're also seeing this dialing back and this watering down of hell among churches who have a proper view of hell and a biblical view as far as their doctrine is concerned. They may adhere to an orthodox um, confession or a solid statement of faith where hell is concerned, but yet they're afraid to preach about hell to the lost because they don't want to offend anyone they don't want to frighten anybody or, God forbid, hurt somebody's feelings. So they avoid any mention of hell in the name of trying to reach one more lost soul. 
Their failure to mention anything about the reality of hell has become a horrible exercise in self-preservation because they're more concerned about people liking them than they're concerned about telling the truth out of concern for souls. Self-preservation. And you young folks who are here tonight, you probably face a lot of temptation in this area of self-preservation. A good friend walks up and says, hey, how do you like my new haircut? And rather than to tell them the truth that you don't like it and you think it makes them look silly, we tell them what they want to hear. And the reason so many people do things like this is because we want people to like us. Self-preservation. Maybe that's not a very good example, but I'll give you another one. Professing Christians often do the same thing with the doctrine of hell. Instead of speaking the truth in love, we'll tell people what they want to hear and we'll leave out the things that make them uncomfortable. Because we care more about ourselves than the spiritual condition of other people. That's called self-preservation. And if we're guilty of that, we need to repent. Because avoiding any mention of hell in our evangelistic efforts is not only an act of sinful self-preservation, but to avoid the truth and reality of hell in evangelism is to try to cheapen the grace of God. These churches are convinced that avoiding any mention of hell will help them attract people and they'll be able to win souls to Christ, but they're not winning anybody to Christ. By avoiding the mention of hell, they're only compromising their own witness and sacrificing their influence for Jesus at the altar of self-preservation. Here's something else. If we attempt to soften our stance concerning hell or water down the doctrine of hell, what we're actually doing is deceiving people. We're lying. And none of us here who are sincere about reaching the lost and sharing the gospel, we would never want to deceive anybody. We'd never want to lie to anybody. But when we cave in to the pressure to omit the doctrine of hell from our gospel presentations... That's exactly what we're doing whether we realize it or not. It is deception. And when we do this, we lie and we make God out to be a liar as well. Some Christians are omitting hell and they are not completely aware of what they're doing. They desire and intend to present a solid, sufficient gospel presentation, but in their omission of hell, be it deliberate or not, they end up neglecting to do what they intended to do. Friends, we've got to preach hell. We've got to mention hell. We've got to talk about hell. We must speak of hell consistently. We cannot omit hell because the Bible does not omit hell. We cannot water down the doctrine of hell because the Bible does not water down the doctrine of hell. We must mention hell. We must mention it often because the Bible mentions it often. They may accuse you of giving a hate speech. They may accuse you of being unloving. They may accuse you of being a hate monger. They may say all of these things, but to fail to warn the lost of the reality of hell is one of the most hateful and unloving things that we could ever perpetrate against our neighbor. If we are to love our neighbors as Christ has commanded, we must follow his example and warn them about hell. Because as important as it is to Love our neighbors. Our love for God should propel us forward in the full declaration of his grace and truth regardless of how that truth is viewed by the unregenerate uh, unregenerate world. Are they going to like the preaching of hell? No. Probably not. But we must preach hell because the word of God commands us to declare his whole counsel. Um, Ryan Denton also points this out in Even If None that the Apostle Paul speaks of divine wrath as one of the primary reasons for evangelism. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11. He said, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. 
but we are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. There's some theological debate surrounding this verse. Some scholars and commentators take the view that Paul was simply defending his motives here because his motives had been questioned and they'll say that he was not talking about persuading men to accept the gospel because he knows how terrifying the judgment of God will be. I'm not convinced that's the case. I'm not convinced that we should be so quick to rule out the idea that Paul was persuading people to believe the gospel because of God's terrifying judgments. There are also scholars and commentators who will point out that the phrase, the terror of the Lord, was common motivation for righteousness in Jewish literature, and it was often associated with the recognition that God would judge. But again... Out of all the people in Scripture who spoke on the subject of hell, nobody spoke about hell more than Jesus Christ spoke about hell. He said this in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. And I say unto you, my friends... Be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no power, excuse me, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Luke 12 and 5 and other verses such as Matthew 10 and 28 reveal to us that Christ preached about hell in his description of the power of God. He preached hell to illustrate that God is able to do what man cannot do. Christ preached that all man can do, which is kill the body, requires the divine, the divine permission of God. Man can only kill the body. And even in killing the body, that requires the divine permission of God. In contrast, God is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. So Luke chapter 12 and verse number 5 is actually strong scriptural testimony against annihilationism. And it gives us a contrast of what man can do in the temporal and over against what man can do in the temporal. The Bible sets out what God can do for everlasting. So we also see John, a man known as the apostle of love. Um, he said this in Revelation 20.15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Joel Beakey states that the question of your destiny from God's perspective depends on whether or not your name is written in the book of life. Amen. And again, uh, Revelation 2015 was written by the apostle of love. Not the apostle of hate. Not the apostle of unkindness but the apostle of, of love. Yet when we preach what the apostle of love preached, they accuse us of being unloving. It's amazing. But we cannot compromise in this area. And that's an overarching application that I really want to leave you with tonight. And I suppose this is where it's turned more from a lecture into a sermon. Um... Don't compromise. Uh, don't compromise. Because no biblical writer, nor Jesus himself, was willing to compromise the gospel by toning down the reality of hell. May God help us all to be unwilling to compromise the gospel by avoiding any mention of hell. If we're going to be people of the truth who share the truth, 
We can only be people of the truth when we speak clearly where the Bible speaks clearly. And it's not for us to worry about whether or not the truth is going to frighten people or to worry about uh, people hearing the message and professing Christ for fire insurance. We are to simply just be faithful and trust God to bring about the results that He desires. Don't compromise on hell because hell demonstrates the justice of God. Justice is the virtue by which God gives everyone what they've got coming. And Denton points out again that hell reveals that God is a sin-avenging judge. He's not the apathetic grandpa of modern evangelicalism. He is a sin-avenging judge. This is fact. And knowing this truth, many people will still try to tone down the doctrine of hell because they fear offending people with straightforward, descriptive, realistic language. Why would we try to tone down our efforts to describe and warn people of the reality of hell when we don't have the vocabulary to describe it sufficiently as it is anyway? We don't have the words to be able to fully describe the terrors of this, pl- of, of this place called hell, but yet rather than making our best effort to do so, we try to tone it down or avoid it altogether. That's the way it is for many people attempting to do evangelism today, but that's not the way it should be. We need to put forth our best effort to describe hell and, and, to, uh, and to present hell as it is revealed in scripture we should at least try don't compromise on hell because the bible is revelation from the god who cannot lie and he has given us a message to proclaim and we must take that message and warn those who are headed to a christless eternity how can we say that we have truly been saved from hell and then take an indifferent attitude about it when we're speaking to others whom we say we would love to see them saved by the grace of God. That's not the mark of someone who loves God. That's not the mark of someone who loves his neighbor. That's the mark of someone who maybe has forgotten what they were delivered from to begin with. Or even worse, it could be the mark of someone who has yet to come to Christ in faith and repentance. So here's a very important question, and I'll leave you with this tonight. If we truly believe... Uh, the testimony of Scripture concerning hell, how could we be silent about it? How could we possibly keep silent about it? If we truly believe that hell is a real place and people will go there unless they come to Christ, how can we say that we love our neighbor and love others as ourselves if we truly neglect our duty to speak to them about hell? We either believe in the reality of hell or we don't. And if we believe it, warning others is the most loving thing that we could do. And if we don't believe it, we're calling God a liar. And that's not a good position to be in, folks. That's not a good position to be in. Let's all pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you, dear God, for your blessings. We thank you, God, for this attentive congregation tonight and I pray God that as this message has gone forth that you would be glorified in it we thank you for the scriptures that have been read and we pray dear God thy will be done give the increase as only you can and we'll praise you and we'll thank you in the sweet name of Jesus Christ our Lord amen and